Okay, so this is part two of this week's lecture. I promise it's going to be short. Um, so we're going to look at the second part where we I'm calling you to remember also that Europeans' presence did bring about a lot of conflict. And conflict in which uh, the martyrdom, especially of uh, 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 not just European uh, propagators of the faith, but also local uh, uh, believers, uh, were often magnified, magnified through the church accounting. Uh, so an example of this can be seen in uh, this rather gruesome depiction uh, from uh, Vietnam. Here we see the local the persecution of uh, the Christian population uh, often resulting in horrible, horrible forms of uh, dismemberment. And this history is a history of very gruesome encounter. Uh, but in the dismemberment, in depicting these dismemberments in such visual terms, uh, it often served to spectacularize the sacrifices of Christianity's followers in the face of persecution. The, um, one of the largest and most epic themes include, uh, included in this story is like the martyrdom at Nagasaki in the 17th century. Uh, uh, this was probably painted in China or Macau, uh, commissioned of course by the Europeans using Chinese um, uh, painters, uh, but will commemorate the uh, shogunate or the samurai classes uh, persecution of Christians uh, during uh, at the port of Nagasaki, uh, and in 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 looking at some of these uh, narratives of persecution, therefore one gets a sense of how Europe sees itself as a victim of a world in barbarity and use this uh, in order to fight back uh, and argue uh, for the need of conquest. And in fact, these serve often as propaganda tools in order to embolden uh, uh, and justify European violence in different parts of the world. Uh, so what happens when a society is entirely uh, subdued on different levels, right? When conquest became almost near total. Uh, uh, let's look at the Philippines as an example in which uh, we often think of as having accepted Christianity. Uh, but in effect, uh, this acceptance itself might point to a very different way in which we can think through this process of adaptation, of acceptance, and dealing through this very violent historical period. So Philippines entered the picture primarily in relation to a Portuguese uh, named Ferdinand Magellan, who defected towards the Spanish camp, and as a result was given uh, uh, opportunity and funding for an expedition that allowed him to set foot in the Philippines around 1521. Uh, there he was said to have planted the cross of Catholicism on the shores of Cebu, which is the island in the, somewhere in the middle of the Philippine archipelago. Uh, and of course this has became a relic uh, and shrine in uh, what is today called the Plaza Sukbo. Uh, so Magellan then proceeded to baptized local chiefs uh, uh, as well as uh, their queens and subjects. Uh, so Magellan did not survive uh, the trip and his companion Pigafetta then uh, is said to have presented three images to the queen who wished to replace her idols after the conversion. Uh, and she was given three articles and namely an Our Lady holding baby Jesus, uh, one of them uh, a, a, a crucifix and finally uh, a, a, a statue of called the Santo Nino and this became really uh, the icon of uh, uh, the Philippines founding moment uh, of encounter with Christianity in some sense uh, because uh, part of this story is that uh, in uh, a while uh, 
after the, that first initial encounter, another Spanish by the name of Miguel Lopez, uh, upon arriving in the Philippines, uh, he would then uh, rediscover the statue in a wooden chest and therefore recognize this as a miraculous occasion. Uh, and this was then celebrated as an annual fiesta uh, where processions uh, were held in the commemoration of the finding and the rediscovery of this Santo Nino uh, uh, artifact and uh, said to be the oldest artifact in the Philippines uh, uh, that was gifted from Magellan to the local Raja. Therefore, the story itself, whether it's true or not, the story itself contains uh, a story of initial contact, but in fact, frames this idea of conquest and conversion along a rather innocent image of a baby Jesus, a baby child. This child-like uh, being is then invested with a crown on top of his head and uh, is someone who holds authority over the world as seen by the, the orb that he holds on his hand and uh, the, the, the gesture of genuflection and teaching that he displays or demonstrates through his other hand. Uh, uh, it's a very sort of like uh, 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 strange image that is filled with a lot of uh, interesting paradoxes, one in which uh, it uses an image of innocence, that of the child and baby, yet invests him with such great authority and power. Uh, and in fact, this became an annual reenactment, uh, uh, often following the mass or the main religious uh, service. Uh, so I think as a founding mythology, therefore, uh, its representation doesn't try to resolve uh, these tensions, but it sustains it through an image, right? Uh, that of innocence, but also one that wields great authority and power. And therefore, uh, in and of itself, it represents this very interesting conflict uh, that sustains uh, a, a constant need to, uh, uh, by the Philippine population, to make sense of what this encounter meant uh, to Philippine of itself. So another significant religious event is uh, the uh, Black Nazarene of Diapo. Uh, in fact, this connects the Philippines to the, uh, 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 the Pacific world. Uh, it was apparently carved by an unknown Mexican uh, craftsman uh, from Darkwood, from the 16th century in Mexico, and was said to be, have been transported to the Philippines around 1606 via the galleon train. And this is the galleon trade that connected Manila to Acapulco in Mexico. Uh, and what is popularly embedded within the story is that uh, there's been a fire on the galleon and it's discharged the wood, although uh, really what has been sort of like suggested uh, recently is that the wood itself came from a particular type of wood commonly used in Mexico for statuary. Uh, the, 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 the icon itself really, the statue itself really depicts Jesus uh, on his way to his crucifixion where he's carrying the cross, uh, right? And uh, this would uh, become an icon that is deeply connected to a particular district in the Philippines, in Manila, called the Quiapo Church, where it continues to remain today. Uh, widely considered to contain miraculous properties, often for the curing of diseases, through by simply touching uh, the the statue itself. So, as a religious procession, it really draws out thousands of devotees, and often three times a year, uh, in January during the anniversary of the icon's translation, or uh, during Good Friday. Uh, commemorating the culmination of the Passion, and in December 31st, during New Year's Eve, uh, on the first day of its annual novena, uh, 
devotees would throng on the streets to try to touch the icon and these events would last up to 20 hours almost. Uh, the Black Nazarene therefore sort of puts the Philippines in conversation and within a larger uh, Iberian uh, Christian social world that connects Philippines not to Southeast Asia but to uh, the Americas and in fact Christ uh, Philippines itself was ruled through New Spain which was Mexico it wasn't a territory that was directly ruled by Spain itself and therefore it had closer connection to the Mexican world than to other parts of Southeast Asia or to Europe as a result although of course in the Philippines uh, the use of Spanish never became prevalent or common in the way that it was uh, totalizing in uh, the Latin American world uh, and in fact uh, Spanish was uh, uh, there was active process in which translation uh, happened so early church fathers or priests were required to actually learn the local languages therefore unlike uh, Latin America, um, uh, Philippines did retain very much its own uh, cultural inflection. Um, outside Quiapo itself, you would see the sales of not just um, candles which you can use to uh, wish, uh, do, make good wishes or wish um, something bad towards your friends or enemies, but there were also sales of a lot of amulets and many of these amulets have deeper connection not just to uh, Christian iconography but also iconographies of the region. So unique to the Philippines, uh, the building of churches that takes on forms that we find familiar to church architecture but also um, manifests very unique and specific attributes uh, such as their squatter or more massive appearances uh, which often resembles a fortress of protective light sort of like quality and these were built necessarily in response to piracy, marauders and also specifically to the geological condition of a country that was that is still very prone to seismic activity. The earthquake was very common in this part of the world and therefore you don't have that kind of gothic tendency to build upwards in a very much slimmer form. Its squat massive form was meant to serve as a bulwark or a protection against uh, the tendency of uh, earthquakes in this part of the world. Uh, very often these were made of uh, very hard stones or, uh, or bricks and then consolidated with lime like many many buildings uh, across the Indian Ocean. Unlike other towns and churches in the Philippines, uh, therefore uh, some example like the one you see here, the Church of Nuestra Senora de Asuncion or Santa Maria, uh, you find it uh, being con uh, taking on an appearance uh, that, uh, that, that is not sited uh, within a central plaza. It's not a space for gathering and uh, for people to meet and, and serving only that social purpose, but rather situated on a hill, it also doubles up as a defensive wall and serves as a fort in, in, in this sense of the term. Uh, there are also distinct architectural highlights uh, such as the enormous buttresses on the sides and backs of the building in the power church of the Church of St. Augustine uh, that you see below, right? And even the uh, Miyagao Church uh, and Iloilo above uh, where an interpretation of European Baroque style of church adapted really to the seismic condition of the Philippine uh, uh, which required them to use enormous buttresses and these are the, the strengthening uh, uh, support that you often, uh, the brick support that you often latch onto both sides of the church so that uh, buildings that were erected vertically upwards 
have some kind of like a weight distributing uh, uh, system in place. Uh, in but then stylistically, what's interesting that is that with its near pyramidal shape, it is reminiscent of the Borobudur on some level, and a prominent part of the facade also includes iconography that depicts a coconut tree as the tree of life where Saint Christopher holds on to uh, uh, is, is dressed rather locally in a local tradition carrying uh, the baby Jesus on his back and not in front of him rather on his back uh, typically like how a mother would carry a child uh, in Southeast Asia which is to strap them on on their back uh, so this is a type of facade that weaves in features from daily life of the people of Miyagao during a time that included the native flora. So besides the coconut tree, uh, such as the papaya tree and other sorts of palm trees and fauna were included and used to express how the church really played, uh, uh, was really part of a local kind of like worldview. Then you see details of uh, how even in uh, the iconography of St. Michael, which is one of the archangels within the Christian heavenly cosmology, you see a depiction of St. Michael holding not a sword, but a kris with its wavy blade uh, that makes the kris a very distinct uh, weapon that, uh, was, that, is, that, that belongs to the Malay world. Right. Also interesting is here he would be seen uh, standing on a figure that doesn't really look very satanic in the conventional European sense of it, the depiction of a demon or, or, or Satan, but rather in a form that looks more like a mermaid or uh, connected to the mermaid is this idea of the dugong. Right. In this way, the Chris and the mermaid-like figure Therefore, uh, our attempts to sort of weave in local cosmology and iconography uh, within a Christian framework. At the same time, as one has uh, adopted and become, uh, have mastered this iconography and this visual language connected to a cosmology and a religious worldview, uh, this also serves uh, in the form that could be repurposed for revolutionary means. So a 19th century talisman of Andreas Bonifacio is in fact something that was uh, used or distributed actively uh, as a means to uh, spread the revolutionary message. And uh, this revolutionary message takes the form and the image of uh, St. Mary holding on to Baby Jesus here, and now what we will often consider as something that is European or foreign in origin is repurposed and retranslated into a local context and given local purpose uh, and expression, often serving a political need that are very specific to the local context. Uh, in this sense, now this Marian amulet that you see here on the screen uh, becomes a calling card. And in fact, it serves as a rallying call, a political rallying call to oust the Spanish authorities who are abusing their station in the Philippines. This actually led to the first colonial uprising, successful one in Asia, uh, in the Philippines itself. So, one last thing to look at is how affinities and conversation was really something that spoke across a huge span of time, uh, such as this very interesting uh, 19th century Calacalla statue of Saint Sebastian that you see on the left. So this is not an image of Jesus, but Saint Sebastian, who was a saint that's often associated with uh, how arrows were being shot at him and therefore all these punctured marks or uh, symbols of him uh, uh, having survived uh, the test of uh, uh, being persecuted 
the shooting of arrows. Uh, and what you see in this uh, uh, rather interesting Keralan statue is that it boasted a, a rather interesting Indian facial characteristics. But this, this is unsurprising. Uh, and nevertheless, uh, uh, especially when you see that uh, at the center of his forehead, there is also this punctured wound that could that resembles a bindi, right? Which is the the mark that you put on your forehead and, uh, if you subscribe to the Hindu faith. Uh, uh, but look at the hand gesture itself in its sort of like outstretched right arm. It is a hand gesture that recalls combination of an older motif, that of abhaya, fearlessness, that you often find in Hinduism and Buddhism. It is also a, a, a gesture of the varada or the boon or the, or the wish granting sort of like mudras. And these are mudras that are readily identifiable and speaks across different religious followers into, across different religious constituencies uh, uh, in, in a sort of like stock vocabulary that connects something like uh, the same veneration within the Christian tradition to a Shiva sculpture that you see next to it. So it's really a fascinating world where localized inflections then inform and shape the iconography of Christianity uh, as it adapted itself to different parts of Asia.